This video is on bacteria and viruses. We will start with viruses. Please feel free to pause the video anytime you need to stop and write more information on your big sheet. To save time, I've pre-written some of the information about viruses. First of all, viruses are non-living and much smaller than bacteria. So if we look at this little bacteriophage right here, this bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So this, if this is a bacteria, this bacteriophage would be like a tiny little virus that infects this bacteria. So viruses are much smaller than bacteria. There are many different examples of types of viruses. So here we have the tobacco mosaic virus, which is a virus that infects plants, adenovirus, influenza virus, and bacteriophage. These two viruses can af affect a wide range of species. The influenza virus affects humans, infects humans and causes the flu. Bacteriophages infect bacteria. All of these viruses have very different external appearances, which is specialized to the type of cell that they infect. Okay. However, all of these viruses are made up of a protein coat on the outside with some kind of nucleic acid on the inside. Could be single-stranded DNA or RNA, double-stranded DNA or RNA. Um, some even have a membrane made of phospholipids stolen from the host cell, but they all have at least these two things. One thing that is really important to note about these viruses is they are classified based on their type of nucleic acid. There's actually, I think, seven categories of viruses. And it's also important to note that the nucleic acids found inside viruses mutate frequently. So those nucleic acids have a high mutation rate because they don't have a proofreading enzyme. This is a really important thing to understand because that's how viruses change their um, outside protein shell. Mutations in their genetic information change their phenotype, which make it harder for our immune system to recognize them, right? Um, so let's briefly talk about the life cycle of viruses. When we're talking about the life cycle of viruses, viral life cycle, we're primarily talking about the lytic and lysogenic cycles. Some viruses only ever go into the lytic cycle, but most viruses can circle between the lytic and lysogenic cycle. When I talk about the lytic cycle, I'm saying a virus infects its cell with its genetic information and then uses that cell in a hostile takeover to make more viruses. Then the cell lyses, releasing um, viruses to infect other cells. Okay, so the lytic cycle is really like this virulent cycle and that's really when cells or organisms are infectious, okay? And this is where like, you might see a very high viral load, like the amount of virus in like our bloodstream, for instance, might be really high if we're in the lytic cycle, okay? So basically what happens, like I said, is the virus replicates rapidly and destroys or lyses the cell. Okay, but sometimes viruses can be pretty sneaky, okay? Let's say a virus infects a cell, and this is the cell's DNA, and this is the viral DNA. And what can happen is that the virus can actually incorporate its genome into the chromosome. Okay, so then you have um, some cellular DNA and some viral DNA. When the virus does this, the viral genome in there is called the prophage. So basically in the lysogenic cycle, okay, the viral DNA is incorporated into the host genome. So the cell replicates viral DNA, now called a prophage because it's stuck, stuck inside the genome of the host cell. Um, 
when it divides. So this is a sneaky way for the virus to propagate itself um, by becoming part of the genome. As the, vi as the cell divides, the viral DNA is replicated. And so then um, more virus genetic information is inside these cells. Okay, so this is often like a long or latent phase that can happen, but something can kickstart the virus from this lysogenic cycle back into the lytic cycle. So like if you ever get a cold sore, right? The cold sore virus never actually leaves. Like let's say you get cold sores on your lips. That virus is actually replicating as a prophage inside your lip cells. And then maybe like heat or stress or a different infection can trigger that virus to start replicating itself as active virus and to go into the, the lytic cycle there. So it can go back and forth. Another type of virus I really want to highlight because of how unique it is, is retroviruses. So this picture right here kind of shows how our retroviruses work. Retroviruses have an alternative flow for their genetic information. They actually have RNA and they can reverse transcribe the RNA. Well, actually, this is just an RNA virus, but if this was a um, retrovirus picture, they can take their viral RNA and they can reverse transcribe it into viral DNA and then they can insert it into the genome. This is an RNA virus, not a retrovirus picture. But um, retroviruses, like I said, have this alternative flow. So they can start with RNA. And then they can take an enzyme. And this enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. And this reverse transcriptase enzyme can take the viral RNA and reverse transcribe it into DNA then this viral DNA can be inserted into the host genome where it can go from DNA to RNA to protein again, kind of like in this lysogenic cycle. And a really good example of a virus that does this is HIV. And one of the reasons HIV mutates so rapidly is because this enzyme reverse transcriptase does a really bad job copying the RNA to DNA. So there's a lot of mutations that occur there. Okay. All right. So that's viruses. Let's jump into bacteria. We already know this about bacteria, but just to kind of review, bacteria are prokaryotes. Okay. They divide by binary fission. And they have no endomembrane system. So this means their chromosome is not inside a nucleus. I'm going to just make it a little brighter. Their chromosome is not inside a nucleus. They don't have an ER. They don't have a Golgi. They're still able to do all their cellular processes, but they usually do them on infoldings of the cell membrane or just in their cytoplasm. So we know that bacteria have one large circular chromosome. It's one loop of DNA here. It is double-stranded. So one double-stranded loop of DNA. And you know they organize their DNA in related sections of genes called operons. We've learned about this, right? And sometimes they also have plasmids. Plasmids are small um, circular molecules of DNA, often taken up from the environment, and they're extra chromosomal. They're separate from the chromosome. So let's, let's write that down. They're small circular molecules of DNA often taken up from the environment and they're known as extra chromosomal. 
because they're separate from the chromosome itself. And, and they replicate independently from the chromosome. And it's always really interesting to me because this is a way for bacteria to increase their genetic variation and to um, rapidly respond to inf changing environmental conditions. When they take up these plasmids, those often, often have genes in them that make them like antibiotic resistant or able to share information. Okay. Um, so these help with kind of like the ability of prokaryotes to do a lot of different things. So bacteria, by the way, this is the virus, right? I was just showing you viral size. Bacteria have a cell membrane. They have a region where their chromosome is found. They have plasmids. They also have ribosomes that do protein synthesis. And they have like little enzymes. And those enzymes do, you know, cellular respiration, like, like parts of cellular respiration, like glycolysis or um, perform a variety of um, chemical reactions to support anabolic or catabolic pathways. Okay, so how can virus, uh, sorry, how can bacteria actually get new genetic information? There are three main ways that bacteria can get new genetic information. And those three ways are highlighted down here. We have transformation, we have transduction, and we have conjugation here. Okay, in transformation, here's our bacteria. Here's our plasmid. The plasmid here is taken up from the environment and can either just hang out in the cytoplasm next to the chromosome or actually be incorporated into the chromosome itself. So we're gonna write down a little bit of information um, about transformation. This is when the bacteria um, takes in Sometimes we call this uptake. DNA, often in plasmid form from the environment. And this is something scientists use a lot of times in genetic engineering. They want to insert a gene into a bacteria to have it express that protein. And they might um, try to get a plasmid, take the bacteria cause the bacteria to uptake a plasmid with whatever the gene that they want to put into the bacteria is. Okay. Um, so we can kind of look at that down here. This is like an example of transformation down here. You can see this bacteria cell. Okay. And let's say um, we want this bacteria cell to um, uptake this plasmid. And on this plasmid, I don't know why we would necessarily want to do it, although bacteria would like it, there are genes on this plasmid for an antibiotic resistance. Okay. And um, this bacteria can take up this plasmid. And then once it's taken up that plasmid, that plasmid has the gene to produce a protein for antibiotic resistance. This is something that bacteria would naturally do to help give them an evolutionary advantage. But um, this is also, this idea of transformation is also used in biotech. Um, for example, it can be used to have bacteria, instead of antibiotic resistance, this plasmid could have a gene for insulin in it, and we could put it into the bacteria and have the bacteria actually make insulin. Um, and then you can isolate that insulin for diabetics. So bacteria naturally do this to give them an evolutionary advantage, but um, we can also use it in biotechnology to have bacteria synthesize um, medications like insulin for diabetics, and it's a cheaper way to make insulin, right? Um, so if we're really thinking about um, transformation, we're thinking about the DNA coming from the environment, but that's not the only way bacteria can get new information. They can also do something called transduction. Um, transduction is when here is your bacteria right here. And then this right here, you guys are really familiar with this little guy. This is the bacteriophage. And this bacteriophage is inserting its genetic code into the bacteria. Okay. So that's transduction. The DNA is coming from 
the bacteriophage from a virus into the bacteria. So it's the viral transmission of new genetic information to a bacteria. That's what transduction is. So viral transmission, AKA the virus can carry and it can carry its own genetic information, but sometimes when a virus infects one bacteria and then goes to infect another bacteria, it's accidentally scooped up some bacterial genes as well. So the virus can actually carry bacterial genes from one bacteria to another bacteria along with its own genetic information. So transduction is what we're really talking about there is the virus carrying bacterial genes Viruses can carry bacterial genes from one bacteria to another, okay, um, which is always really, really interesting. Um, and I actually want to go back to this in just a second when we talk about viruses. Um, the last example right here is conjugation. Conjugation is when this is like bacteria number one. And this is bacteria number two. Okay. Conjugation is when um, it's a cell to cell transfer. So basically in a cell to cell transfer, we're transferring DNA between bacteria. So this plasmid is being copied and a copy is being sent to this bacteria. This is helpful when like bacteria wanna transfer antibiotic resistance to each other, okay? Now, all of these can change the phenotype of the bacteria by introducing new genetic information. So I wanna do a quick like highlight and link to evolution here, okay? So if we think about new DNA, okay? New DNA can like change or add genes. And that's basically um, our genotype we're changing, right? And the change in our genotype can result in um, a change in the type or amount of a protein produced. And that's basically our phenotype here, right? And um, this change in the phenotype is subject to natural selection. Okay. And this could enhance survival and reproduction in different environmental conditions, right? So for example, if this bacteria transferred an antibiotic resistance gene to this bacteria, all of a sudden this bacteria has a new phenotype antibiotic resistance and the environment, if, if antibiotics come into the environment, it makes that bacteria more likely to survive and reproduce. So this is how bacteria can get new information. I actually want to go back to viruses because I think that there's an interesting link to this with viruses, right? I said that bacteria can get new bacterial genes if one bacteriophage infects one bacteria and picks up some extra bacterial genes by accident and then puts them in another bacteria, we can transfer bacterial genes between bacteria using a, a viral vector, right? But viruses are really interesting because let's say a virus, um, like there's like a common cell here, right? And there's like a groups of related viruses. So let's say you have, okay, COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2, and you have another coronavirus, like a cold um, coronavirus, and they both infect the cells with their genetic information. Well, there can be some like recombination of their genetic information to get kind of a new mutated virus there. So it is entirely possible that if um, related viruses infect the same host cell, um, they can recombine their genes. And then actually, um, we saw that happening with COVID in one of the um, 
cold viruses because COVID is a type of coronavirus and colds are, a lot of colds are caused by coronaviruses as well. And we saw like an increase in transmissibility, but a decrease in pathogenicity because of these two combined genomes here. So just one last thing to note about viruses here, right? Related viruses. can combine or recombine genetic info if they infect the same host cell. So I hope you enjoyed my video on bacteria and viruses um, and learned a little bit about them and how they work. Thanks so much.